Hello there. Um, I'm Emma Kate and I'm an architect by trade. Um, I teach architecture and I make buildings, but I also make music. And my current PhD research is exploring spatiotemporal reciprocities between music and architecture. So in today's presentation, I'm going to be talking about the ways in which I use music, not necessarily as an expression of an idea, um, but as a mechanism for understanding space and how this might start to help architects and acousticians, which I guess are my audience, to better understand how to design for new music. Um, I also want to understand where opportunities might exist for encouraging new audiences, specifically those who aren't formally trained in music and architecture, to engage with ideas of sight, space and sound through the performance of spatial music. Um, but first, I'm going to talk a little bit about what I mean by spatial music, as I suppose it could be argued that all music is inherently spatial. So historically, architectural space has played a very active role in influencing the experience and composition of music. The Dutch Renaissance composer Adrian Willert is supposedly famous for having supposedly invented polychoral music through antiphonal music as a response to the spatially opposing um, chorister positions in St. Mark's Basilica in Venice. Um, and this style became known as Chorus Bazzati, which literally translates into separated choirs. So this is a, a very early but pretty straightforward example of spatial music. Um, on the other hand, architects and engineers have long acknowledged the desires of music in space. And long before acoustics was formally a formally recognised discipline, the Roman architect and engineer Vitruvius discusses a method for enhancing the sonic character of theatres and performance spaces by embedding a kia or acoustic vases in the walls. Though the actual success of this is up for debate if you speak to an acoustician about that. Um, and more recently, architects and composers have collaborated. So the pictured example here shows uh, a space that was designed by architect Renzo Piano, which was designed and built specifically for the performance of composer Luigi Nono's opera Prometheus. And in this project, both uh, Nono and Piano were thinking about the performance space as an instrument in itself, as opposed to a, a mere container for musical instruments. So this physical reciprocity between music as constructed sound and architecture as constructed space is one that I'm personally very interested in, in my own research, especially at a time when our experience of music is arguably becoming more virtual. And by that, I mean more divorced from a spatial, physical reality. Um, and our lives are increasingly saturated with the availability of digital media. We're, we're largely inseparable from the portable technologies that enable us to create and consume media on demand whenever and wherever. And as a result, it's now completely normal, almost expected, that the music that we so regularly consume originally sounded anywhere except the space where we are now, even to the point where this space is quite often forgotten or overlooked or considered unimportant. And mm -hmm. it's also now much easier to capture the geometry of existing spaces in, in their entirety in 3D. So this picture here is a, it's a 3D scanner that I used uh, to capture the geometry of this church here. And once this geometry has been captured, um, amongst other sorts of spatial sound data, we can easily simulate how sound might behave in these spaces without ever needing to physically set foot in them. And this is not necessarily a bad thing. Such uh, sophisticated digital tools have made it possible to simulate spatial realities in recorded music. And as such, ideas of sight and space in music have largely shifted from the, the physical to the virtual. Arguably, our everyday experience of music considers the loudspeaker to be the site of the sound, whether in our rooms or directly in our ears, and typically these sites exist in stereo. With regard to live music in a physical setting, and obviously there are lots of examples that we've seen throughout this conference that, that break with this convention, but typically um, it's most often played in theatres and concert halls which were designed by architects, engineers and acousticians to cater for all genres of music. And the architectural result of this space is one which necessarily provides a standardized and generic acoustic and audience performer layout. 
which means our usual experience of live music is conventionally frontal and static, and we sit face to face with the performers. And when we listen to music frontally in this way, it sort of hits us like a flat sheet, and any physical distance between sound sources is considered unimportant as it's largely imperceptible, as it either doesn't exist in significant amounts or it becomes corrected um, in the conducting of the piece. And music is similarly flattened when we listen to it on stereo headphones or stereo loudspeakers at home. So the convenience of this stereo format of recorded music and the conventional frontal delivery of live music has flattened what could otherwise be a much more complex, rich and dynamic relationship between music and architecture. Of course, I'm not the first person to realise this. In contrast to the norm, uh, spatial composers such as Henry Brandt, amongst others, have explored a large number of parallels between musical space and physical space in their compositions and performances. Stockhausen's Gruppen is another obvious example, and in this piece, the music is played by three orchestras distributed around the edges of the performance space, with the audience generally free to roam around in the space between them. So I managed to catch a performance of this um, this summer at the Tate Modern Turbine Hall by the London Symphony Orchestra. And interestingly, by the end of the performance, about 90% of the audience were all facing in the same direction, standing still and looking at the middle stage, as they might in a conventional performance, <laughs> despite it being a pretty unconventional setup. So though this Stockhausen example is undoubtedly spatial, um, it did come under some criticism from Henry Brandt, who I think, by contrast, is rather more precise with his ideas of how aspects of physical space, particularly distance and direction, can be as compositionally active as the musical elements of tone and timbre. And in an interview, Brandt once said that one of the essential realities of spatial music is that the direction and tonal quality should work together to identify certain kinds of music. And if this can't be done, or if it's not done, then the space doesn't really do anything at all except create confusion. As a result, Brandt's music explicitly defines these relationships between spatial ideas of distance and direction in physical space and distance and direction in musical structure in terms of tone and timbre. And again, this, this mapping of spatial concepts in music to representations of such concepts in Cartesian space isn't a new idea because there's, there's already a relationship between pitch and the physical distance of its, of its wavelength but also in the way that Western musical notation is conventionally displayed, where time is existing in one axis and pitch is in the perpendicular axis. So this, this graphic organisation of pitch against time could be analogous to the X and Y axes in Cartesian representations of physical space, which is typical in architectural representation. And this is something that we will see in action in the performance shortly. Um, so it's, it's worth me mentioning that I refer to my compositions as devices, as I intend for them to act as tools for measuring the spaces in which they're performed. Mm -hmm. And the first of the, first of the series in, in my research, which was performed last year, Device One, explored the horizontal symmetry of the Church of St. Leonard in Shoreditch. Um, and I split the orchestra into two halves and was trying to explore the distance between these two halves, physically and musically. And to quickly give a, a specific example, there's a particular passage where we get an implied rhythm from the oscillation of notes that are really close to each other. So the instruments which are producing these notes are the oboe and the flute. And as you probably are already aware, the oboe is very often the instrument which first uh, sounds during the tuning of an orchestra, as apparently this instrument is the most materially stable in terms of its response to humidity and temperature, um, and also has the, the cleanest tone in, ter in terms of its, the, the clarity of its overtones and the same sort of true of the flute. So both instruments um, in this passage are playing a long repeating pattern of minor second intervals between A and A flat. And what's more, the highish register in which they're sounding is reinforcing the closeness of these notes as the wavelengths in the upper register, as you know, are physically shorter. Um, the passage, as it's notated, shows this regular repeating rhythm, but crucially, this the notated rhythm isn't the one that we are perceiving and hearing. Um, as the mus musicians are actually spatially organised in a way which works against the what you'd expect uh, the rotating rhythm to to reinforce. Um, 
So what we do hear and perceive in this is a rhythm that's implied by the oscillation between close notes. And this isn't notated in the, in the music, but it is experienced. So in this sense, the physical space is a, is a crucial component of the way the music is behaving. And there's, there's an orchestration between, um, in the relationship between the interaction of the close tones in the space against the spatial organisation of the musicians. Um, and this is, this is what I mean by spatial music. Um, and in this example, the music is as much a spatial construction as the architecture in which it's played. So the ideas of rhythm that are heard and perceived are intrinsically linked to the musical organisation of the, the tonal aspects of the music, and they emerge in a way which isn't immediately visible in the notation. It, it all sort of emerges through the, the performance in the space. Um, and it's at this point, I, I'll just quickly talk about the... Um, the explicit role of the architecture in this setup, because obviously I'm talking about one kind of constructed space in music, but then there's a space in which this spatial music construction is played. And obviously each room has its own acoustic response. Um, and the, this is probably something which it seems that Brandt, Henry Brandt is less concerned with this. Um, but crucially, during the performance of Device One, the reverberation of the room, which was around three seconds, had the effect of blending the sounds and mitigating this effect of the, the split and the directionality of the sound sources. So this was a, a sort of, I considered this a, an infection of the music um, by the acoustic opinions of the room. And in response to this, um, I wrote a piece called Device 2 as an experiment to test whether the acoustic response of the room actually has the capacity to change the structure of the music itself. So, written for cello and violin, um, this piece was performed in three acoustically distinctive settings. The first, as you can see here, is an anechoic chamber with zero uh, acoustic response, which the musicians absolutely hated. Um, also, on the balconies of the Royal Academy of Arts Library, which is also very acoustically dry, um, but we did have the advantage of being able to put the musicians on opposite sides of the room. And then finally, we went to Gaudi's Sagrada Familia, um, in Barcelona, and the result of this um, series of performances in this instance predictably saw the 12 second reverberation time that, that happens in this building um, transformed elements, melodic elements that were heard very distinctively in the anechoic chamber into harmonic structures blended, which blended with this reverberation, despite the musicians being placed over 60 metres apart in this instance. So, Contrary to Henry Brandt's ideas, the horizontal distance between the musicians in, in this piece resulted in a much greater blending of the two parts and rendered any ideas of directionality almost imperceptible. Um, and by contrast, the, the piece that you're about to hear today, device three, um, considers this time considers the loudspeaker initially as the site of the sound and the response of the space that, that you might be able to perceive um, is simulated, so you're actually hearing a space other than the one that you're in. Um, and in order to simulate and calibrate the spatial and musical elements, I've been working with the acoustic engineers at Max Fordham, um, and this picture shows their sound space setup, which is typically used for simulating the way that buildings are going to sound prior to their construction. But for this project, I've been, I've been using it to simulate the sound of another space um, in order to... Um, understand musically how I can correlate the two. So in the piece that you're about to hear, each sound source is arranged in this space about a circle, which it, for the moment is a pure geometric condition that is going to change according to where it gets performed next. But today, as this is the, the first outing of the piece, we're, we're testing a pure circular form. And I'm also going to show you um, in parallel to this, a live drawing which visualises the musical relationships in 3D space. And originally I developed this tool for my own benefit, just for visually verifying the effects, um, because after all I'm an architect and I like to see things, um, especially drawings. And it's, so it's not actually been developed as an integral part of the overall experience, uh, it's more of a reference tool, so you might want to ignore it, um, but it's there. So in a moment, I'm going to invite you to take your position on the stage um, in this sort of area, if we can all fit. Um, and 
I'll just quickly talk a little bit about um, how I've written the music to respond to this spatial condition. So um, Henry, Henry Brown, I've talked about him again, he, he identified that there's not necessarily an optimal listening position in spatial music because it's so complex. And um, for this reason, I've decided to work with the concept of axes um, or you know, a line between two points. And these axes define regions. And what I mean by a region tonally is that the piece has a, a sort of tonal center around A440. And around this region, um, I've established small clusters of smaller regions um, in sort of minor second intervals. And most of the time, the respective sound sources are in the same octave, but occasionally the, the violins reach a bit higher and the cellos reach a bit lower. And this just further reinforces these identities as axes, which can cut through the regions. Um, and the spatial positioning of the speakers in this room um, is going to be visualized on the screen, I hope, if it works. Um, and in performing, in performing this piece with you now, I'd, I'd like to understand, in the questions at the end, I'd like to understand your perceptions of distance and direction um, specifically in terms of the relationships between the spatial positions of the, the sound sources. Um, but also, when you, when you feel that the distance is changing as a result of the tonal qualities of the music. Um, and also, I'd, I'd, I think it would be useful to hear your thoughts on how this kind of calibrated, spatialised music might be useful beyond... Um, beyond being a performance in its own right. So as, as I said in the beginning, I'm very interested in how this can become a tool for, for architects to understand the musical desires of a performance space, but also perhaps in turn for musicians to understand the space of orge orge uh, orchestration. So uh, it's a two and a half minute piece. So I'd like to invite you all to <coughs> occupy the space and work on doing that. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
because it was like discovering I like this that it was a uh, space was it introduced somehow point by point and then in this diagonal line another line and like this I felt like as if my imagination of the space was expanding mm. like but then um, I think somewhere I figured out how big it is mm -hmm. and then yeah, then maybe the spe specialization didn't, um, I don't know. Yeah, it, uh, I don't know if I paid attention to it so much after I kind of had it already in my mind. I see. How big it was. I'm not sure I would have to listen to it again. <laughs> yeah. Also, the, the bit in the middle um, is, yeah. it's almost deliberately chaotic to sort of right. disorient you. Yeah. And then those kind of banging sounds that you hear that shocks you into re-listening to try and sort of shock you out mm. of um, going into autopilot but maybe they need to be more 
shocking. <laughs> For me, Other I guess. experiences or remarks? Yeah, for, for me, I was just going to say that for me what happened is there were kind of three layers and I think it was too much for only one time listening because mm -hmm. I had like, um, I, I looked at the loudspeakers and then of course because of ambisonics you hear further distances than the loudspeakers are actually from you and then with the graphics which you probably not go, would not show in a like, this yeah. is a, uh, like Originally testing situation. Yeah. But so for me, there were like two, uh, there were like three um, sound words in a way, you know, and it was somehow, so I, I, when I closed my eyes, the experience was most intense, I guess, for myself. Because mm -hmm. if not, I was very dis disoriented by, oh, there's a speaker, oh, this is, this is another di dimensionality in a way, mm -hmm. and then what I hear is again different. It's mm. okay. I should say, actually, I really like seeing the graphics. I'm a visual person mm. too, and for me, that really enhanced what I was listening to and if I, because I couldn't quite work out where sounds were coming from so having that visual representation for me was mm -hmm. totally enhanced the experience I think for some audiences to kind of follow a school yeah. who are not necessarily reading traditional notation that might be quite interesting for them so I think mm -hmm. I can't think of any intelligent question to ask you because that was completely fascinating <laughs> uh, I was uh, equally uh, engaged with the visuals so like in Gerupen I looked forward because that's where they were projected. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, equally, if you had a diagonal with a point right in the middle and the whole line, I'm not quite sure I, I, I heard that, although I heard the line. Mm -hmm. If you had a circle with an octagon set within it, I couldn't process how to deal with that. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe because some of us are so learned in this stuff, because we have all sorts of representations uh, for sound, for space, and for every parameter that you can come up with. Uh, we try to understand as we listen, and of course it's happening quickly and so on and so forth. So I found it illuminating and I found it problematic at the same time mm -hmm. because I wasn't hearing what I saw. Okay. Uh, on the other hand, I think including it enhances uh, mm -hmm. an experience. Uh, but it also takes away from the musical following of what's going on mm -hmm. okay. uh, because you're following the space. And you're facing the screen. And you're facing the screen, <laughs> not wandering around. Yeah. Uh, I find that a little less problematic. I think I could do this. Uh, but I actually have another question. You had a wonderful picture that I'd forgotten about with Henry Brown with a ladder. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so what about that other dimension? The height. In, interestingly, that was um, in the other project, the Sagrada Familia project. I was working with a guy uh, called Jim Barber, who has just graduated. He's just finished his PhD at the University of Swinburne in Australia, and he's particularly interested in recording space, recording sound in space with Amazonic microphone setups. But rather than concentrating on the sort of horizontal spread, he wants to capture the height, and that building is. Really Very high. high. It's, at some point, the musicians were you know, up five yeah, yeah. meters and meters. Um, and um, yeah, it's. I think it, in this in this setup, everything is obviously on the same datum. Um, but in the Sagrada Familia and in the Ambisonic Slam, there are there are opportunities to place sound sources not just on a horizontal plane. Well, but we did. We, uh, I mean, we had this too. Mm. But I mean, for this piece. It's, oh, I see. I see. Yeah, okay. Sort of, uh -huh. It's another, another project, probably. Yeah. No, I would just think you, as architect, would have a better idea how you would want to deal with the extra dimension when you have access. Yeah. I mean, it's it's also um, there are lots of parameters to play with, and I think because this piece is it's in its first iteration and something I didn't talk about is how the other projects develop with each place they're performed in they develop iteratively um, mm -hmm. and this piece I, I wanted to keep some things uninfected and, and pure to kind of understand where the problems are because I, as I was saying before they're, they're devices as much as they are sort of expressions of an idea um, so they I put them out there, see how they 
respond and how people respond to them and then they change for the next place. So this is all really interesting for me to hear your feedback as well. Anything else? Yes. Just a quick um, mention of Osaka 1970 World Fair. I don't know if you know about the space theater. I know the book. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry? Uh, yeah, I know of it. Because I think, um, you know, Stockhausen, Tanakis, many, many composers were part of those 70. And uh, this space theater, I think to this day, has never been uh, equaled with the 800 speakers mm -hmm. below the floor, over on the walls, and everything else. I mean, it was so incredibly important at the time. Uh, and so many people and important composers saw it, and I think it really had a huge influence on their way of thinking of music and space and spatializing music and, and everything else. And um, the good news is I was in Japan very recently and happened to see it uh, because there was an exhibit that was going on because it has been closed for a year. A year. Mm -hmm. And they opened it for like a retrospective exhibit about it, it was so <laughs> 70s. And it was so successful that the city of Osaka has received now a grant from the Japanese government to um, restore the theater and that it's going to become a, 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 a live venue again. Mm -hmm. So it'll be very interesting to see what uh, what happens in this. Well, one of the problems with this stuff historically has been these magnificent uh, spaces that they created, not least the Hirt Tower. And then you get a commission for this space because the space is dynamic, it can change and keep with the time, and there's nowhere else in the world that you can play it. And so, like, I have a concert soon at SARC in Belfast, and it'll be the first time in about 20 years I'll have loudspeakers underneath. Mm -hmm. I can finally hear my pieces again. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a problem, you know? You want to hear your pieces a little bit more than once, mm -hmm. uh, but if you do it in a space like that, it becomes very difficult because you have to keep playing in the same order. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Yeah, maybe. Just one, um, I was really fascinated by your presentation. Thank you so much. Um, I was just curious, personally, to know how I see how you're using architecture for music. How does music play back into your architect, uh, your personal architect? I think at the moment, um, because I'm teaching architecture, I, I'm trying to get students to understand how they can design um, other than visually, because it's a very visually dominated profession. Um, and, and unless you can kind of draw it or, or rep represent it, through visual means, um, it's not considered valid somehow. Um, so there's, there's kind of a, a small cell of architects and musicians, such as myself, who are trying to elevate, um, not the practice of acoustics, because I think I think acoustics is problematic in lots of ways, but um, elevate this idea of spatial listening um, and understanding space as a, as a multi-sensory thing, not just a visual thing. Um, that I think would be, it'd be really beneficial for architects to engage more with that. And um, I think because I'm, I'm also a musician, I, I just sort of selfishly thought, oh, I'll start using music as a, way of, um, as a way of making people think like this, because it's my kind of communication tool in a way. Um, but it, it would be interesting that there are projects ongoing at the moment where I'm um, trying to understand how you might be able to inhabit an instrument or the instrument could react to, to what it's playing or uh, sort of dissolving this boundary between the instrument as an object in a space and uh, playing with that um, the, the stuff in between. Could, could the instrument be the space and vice versa? I don't know if that sort of answered your question. <laughs> yeah, I think it's very important, as you said, to, uh, for the architects also to be informed of the sound because yeah. it's not mm. always considered. So that's why I asked that question because I, I discussed a little things with architects and that's one of the frustrations that is not adequately addressed mm. in, in the courses. So yeah, I it's think not this taught. is really important. Yeah. yeah. It's um I think it, it should probably as as we've seen from the conference the conference presentation so far, it sort of starts with the education um and getting people to value that stuff from the beginning, so it's it's in their mind and they're thinking about it when they're in practice. Mm. Well, that's a great final statement. Thank you ever so much. Mm -hmm.